So today, we're going to look at why is Christianity like a traffic light? I'm going to, whoever wanted to know that. You know, if you want to grow spiritually, what do we say? Go and study your Bible. But I'm going to say today, you cannot only study your Bible. Because there's more to it than that. And you're going to say, oh, but I thought studying the Bible is good. And I'm saying it is good. Because in the first place, it helps us to know God. It gives us a target to be ever better able to point our growth efforts towards. But it's not enough. You know, you can study piano technique as much as you like. It doesn't make you a piano player. When do you grow? When you actually play the piano. You know, I learned to bake bread a while back. And it's one thing to look it up in a how-to-make-bread book. It's quite another then to stand in front of the flour and the yeast. I did some sourdough at some point, so you've got a starter bubbling away. Now what? And your first efforts result in something. But in your first efforts, you realize, oh, a bit more of this, a bit less of that. You know, you, you, you have something and you realize, I'm not quite sure where to go. So you do some more studying and then you come back and you try something and you change it. And, and slowly over time, you get better and better at it as you kind of learn the little nuances of the whole baking process. And then summer comes along and it's a bit warmer. And then winter comes along and it's a bit colder and you have to keep on adjusting the process. And we can look at a thousand scenarios. They're all like that. I mean, if you ask anyone in a job today, is studying alone enough? It might get you through the front door, but you need to do more than that. But yet, what are we asking each other regularly? What are you studying at the moment? And what do we tell ourselves? Well, I need to study something like pride or humility or whatever it is that, uh, you know, that, that we need to grow in our character. And you feel your quiet time is only complete when you've studied your Bible. Or well, today, I want to look at something a little different. I want to look at the traffic light method of spiritual growth. Let's see if this works. There we go. Red lights, stop. You know, one of the hardest things to do in this modern age is to stop, isn't it? And even when the traffic light does turn red, we're annoyed because we don't like stopping, do we? But today I want us to stop. To stop doing, to stop planning, to stop worrying, to stop catastrophizing, to stop what ifing, to stop looking at our phone, to stop looking at the TV, to just... Why is this important? Because the Bible says it's an important part of our Christian growth. We have to stop everything else before we can do this. Because only once we've stopped, what can we do then? Meditate. What is meditation? Stopping everything, emptying your mind, Focus on a belief, a thought, an idea, a concept, an assumption, something uncertain, and then pondering on it and how it affects your life or my life. Let's gather some information on meditation. Does it appear in the Bible as a word or a concept? Well, actually it does. It's first... Appearance in the Bible is in Genesis 24, verse 62. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate. As he looked up, he saw camels approaching. So all the rest, not that interesting. That one line, he went out to meditate. It sounds like something he does regularly. Might be every day. It might not be. I don't know. But he had to think deeply about something. He needed to go outside. Maybe he had a favorite spot. He needed peace and quiet. Maybe he was trying to get away from the business in the household. Maybe there were four grandchildren in the house and he couldn't find any peace. <laughs> there is that possibility. 
But Isaac made a plan because it was important for him. And it was so important for the rest of us that God put it in the Bible. It's a word we actually vaguely understand, but what does it mean? It means to focus one's mind for a period of time. Quietly, and actually if you look at the definition, you can even speak or hum or regularly repeat something, but something to focus the mind. Personally, I've got a couple of places. Strange places. I find my best thinking happens on my morning run. And why? Because I've got more blood flowing through my brain, which I think is a strange but technically sound reason. I'm actually able to think of something while I'm running, and I just have to look up every now and again to make sure I'm still running in the right direction, but I'm actually able to clarify thoughts, think about stuff, uh, and, and actually develop ideas for sermons or for Bible talks. Or it's, it's a wonderful time. My morning run. Don't laugh now, but also in my morning bath. Yes, I bath. I love to lie and think, because it's quiet. No one can disturb you in the bath. It's wonderful. Other than your wife, of course, but she's busy with her stuff. I can think, and I think about stuff. When I have my morning coffee, we get up early, bath, well, run, bath, have coffee, hopefully, before the kids come out. But we just sit and have coffee, and in the quietness, as we look at nature, we think. Quiet times. Is meditation critical, or can I just get by studying the Bible? Well, that's a good question. Joshua 1 verse 7, the Bible says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my sermon Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Moses has just passed away. God starts prepping Joshua to take over from him. We make the assumption, Joshua knew the, uh, the Bible as it was at that point. We know that because he, God doesn't say to him, study the Bible. He says, he says, keep the book on your lips. In other words, he's constantly repeating stuff that he already knows is already existing in his head. He says, meditate on it. Keep them on your lips like lipstick. Now, I'm not a lipstick fan. It's just an analogy. Because it's critical. Keep it there day and night, the passage says. Because why? Because your life, each and every day, is always you versus the Scriptures. Life wants to take you somewhere. The scriptures are saying, here's the best way. And that's where day and night comes into it. And be careful to do everything written in it. This is the path to spiritual success. I know I can be too casual with God's word. Because sometimes it feels that as long as I know what it says, I am already miles ahead of many people. Who thinks that way? Because I know what it says. I'm ahead of others. But is knowledge what God is looking for? So let's apply the spiritual act of meditation on our current understanding of meditation. Maybe my current way of thinking knowledge is enough is not great. Maybe I should meditate on this verse. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. I can know everything, but if people cannot see it in me, it doesn't matter what I know. Because love is what you're seeing in me. It is my application of the scriptures 
to the life around me. I have to start with the Scriptures, but I cannot stop there. What about this one? 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. Too much knowledge is not good for us. It can puff us up. Because then we think we know something when actually we do not know anything. So what do we know? Because we don't know what we don't know. I love that expression. I mean, I can't know something if I don't know it. I've got to know something before I can know it. It's kind of a this, this repetitive thing. But I think it's a safe assumption that we will always have much to learn. And another safe assumption is that I will always like to think I know enough. Because I'm human. I need knowledge because I need to meditate on something. But knowledge alone does not make me a Christian or a follower of Jesus. I need to stop and think. I need to meditate on the Scriptures and how my life integrates with them. I have yet to meditate on a Scripture and not get new insight from it. I do not get insight from just reading the Scriptures. I get insight when I chew on them. So what do I do while meditating? I make decisions. Orange light. I need to decide. What do you do, men, when you come up to a traffic light and it turns orange? Accelerate. <laughs> well, I say it depends on if my wife is with me. If she is, of course I stop. And if she isn't, of course I stop. <laughs> what are you thinking? Because it's the right thing to do. But the point is I have to make a decision. If I'm really close, like really, really close, I do nothing and I just cruise it through. If I'm far, I stop. But you know that there's this gray area where you're like, you have a split second to decide, are we going to run it or are we going to really break hard and you know, mess up the groceries in the back and the kids will smudge their faces on the back seats. And No, we can't have that. We just you know, we roll it. But we have to decide. We have to make a decision. And we have to make a decision because we are meditating on meditation. We have to decide, is this a great thing or not? And then we get to the arguments. We're deciding now. You know, on the one hand, I've been going to church for 30 odd years, almost 30. I think this year is our 30th spiritual anniversary. So I should know what I'm doing. But on the other hand, do I somehow seriously think I have attained Jesus' level? No matter how many years I've been at church. But on the one hand, I know about meditation because I read my Bible every day. And I've come across the term now and again. I know it exists. But on the other hand, knowing about meditation and meditating are two completely different things. It's like knowing a recipe for a cake versus actually baking the cake. You know, if, if I said, you come for coffee, I know a recipe... Would you come? Or if my wife says, come for coffee, I know a great recipe, and I've baked the cake, would you rather go to her or come to me because I know the recipe? Now, clearly, you need, the, you need some cake. Knowing the recipe is only so far. On the one hand, I've figured out this Christianity thing, and I have a routine that works for me. And I'm comfortable where I'm at. I have my groove. But I don't meditate. But on the other hand, God says that the one who meditates on his law is blessed. I want to be blessed. 
on the one hand, there's me and my opinion. And on the other hand, there's God and His Word. So, I'm, I've got to decide. So I'm sitting in my quiet place and the words of God flowing through my mind and across my lips. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on His law day and night. Psalm 119 says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. 1 Timothy 4 says, Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch your life and doctrine closely. I have read that a thousand times. But is that part of my life? Every day I need to stop and decide, how is my walk with God? How were those interactions with the kids yesterday? Were they great? Not so great. Did I treat my wife kindly the whole day? Was I helpful in the house? Or are others doing more than me? Are my thoughtless actions causing others to struggle? Am I aware of the needs of others around me and the things they are going through? Am I empathetic? Do I see the need around me or is it always about my needs? Think, meditate, ponder, compare, search for those areas in which you can improve. Watch your life and your doctrine. Persevere because that process will save both you and your hearers. That process of spiritual self improvement. Is meditation great? Some great benefits, great spiritual benefits, great growth benefits. God will bless me. There's a lot on that hand. And then eventually, go, go, go. We all love this one. Foot, and, foot on the gas. Have you ever noticed the difference between men and women drivers? Greg's going to come up and share with us. He may take a while because his knee's broken. But it's getting fixed. When we stop at a traffic light, my wife looks out. What do you think she, she sees next to her? She says, oh, I love the color of that car. Especially the red one. Oh, that driver's on his cell phone. That's not right. The kids are not tied in. Very important one in our household. What has she done with her hair this morning? If you're on the school run and you know someone's very stressed and harassed next to you. Men, had arrived, men arrive at a traffic light and it's a little different. I look next door and I think, I wonder if that's the X3 or the X5. Is this the one that comes with the performance upgrades? I'm not sure. I can't really see it from the side. I wonder if I can beat him to the traffic light. <laughs> but you don't know yet because he hasn't looked at you, so you keep looking at him. <laughs> and he knows you're looking at him. He's busy evaluating what car was that that stopped because I can't look. I've, I've hopefully, I've hopefully, I think, yeah, it's, it's a very old Merc. Oh, we, can, we can easily drop him. Then he'll look at me. And then uh, the race is on. It's very different. Clearly men need help, but I mean, that's not the point. So we are having a meditative Christian moment. We have stopped and we are thinking deeply about meditation. We have compared our lives to God's Word, and we've noticed a difference. We say, man, I never meditate. There's the difference. We have to make a decision. And remember that even no decision is a decision. Am I going to go? Am I not going to go? You know, go is a funny word. It's only two letters long, but the definitions can vary wildly. When, when, when we say to the grandkids... It's hot. You can go to the deep freeze and get ice lollies. Boom! You just see dust. And the little one, you know, he's a bit slower behind, but he'll get there. He's not quite the level of the deep freeze, but he'll make a plan. 
Either the others lift him up or he'll drag a chair along, but he's, he's, he's going to get his eyes slowly. Stuff happens. The end result, silence and the sound of licking. When the evening draws to a close and you say to the grandkids, I don't say it, the children say it, go and brush your teeth and get into bed. The reaction is slightly different. In fact, the reaction is very different to the point where you'd have difficulty in discerning whether anything was said at all. Because it feels like the whole room has suddenly filled with molasses and it's like, uh, everything has is, everything is slowed down. So either nothing moves or the debating committee starts warming up. But didn't you say, but isn't there still three minutes? But you said five weeks ago that on this day I could, you know? Has the word go changed in meaning? No. What has changed? Our desire to follow its clear and obvious instruction. They want a lolly. They don't want to go to bed. It's clear and obvious. And as adults, we're no different. The only difference is, I think, is that the older you get, you, at some point, maturity kicks in. Some point. Not sure quite when. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And basically, with that journey, kickstart the plan of redemption that God knows everything about. This is God's plan, and he says to Abram, go. Abram, mortal man, knows nothing. He just has to obey, and off he goes. But sometimes God speaks, and people don't just go. Exodus 3. We know some of the background. There's a burning bush. Moses has a look at it. God says to Moses, a couple of things. I've kind of abbreviated it a bit here. God says to Moses, you're the man to lead my people out of Egypt. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? If the people ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. I am not eloquent. I am slow of speech and of tongue. And of course, the best one, please send someone else. You get the goer and you get the debater. Doesn't this sound like some of the conversations you have in your own head? You're debating now. Ever since I brought up meditation, hmm. I'm not sure it's for me. Where am I going to go? How am I going to do it? I don't know. Like Moses, I can come up with a host of reasons why I do not need to do something. What has the voice in my head been saying? I don't have time. I don't know how to do it. It's mainly in the Old Testament anyway. I'm experienced enough in having quiet times. My method works for me. In the end, what are we saying? Lord... Please ask me just to read my Bible. That's actually what I want. I just want to stay the way I am. I want to follow you my way. But God persevered with Moses, even though God himself became angry and Moses finally went. And another massive leg of our journey of redemption was started. Christianity is like a traffic light. And every time we study the Bible, and we stop, and we meditate on our obedience to what we happen to be studying, we can then decide on embarking on a path of change, or not. And then we can go, and because we change, the world around us also changes. When we change... God's plan of redemption moves forward because we have
have become more obedient to the Scriptures. And that single action of obedience may be a huge forward movement in God's plan of redemption. I think sometimes we think we're small in this plan. And yet God chose everyday people to follow him. And I'm saying today, stop, think, decide, and then go. And our spiritual lives can be very different moving forward this year. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much, Father. We thank you for loving us and guiding us and giving us your scriptures, Father. We... We've all read and we've all studied and we've all looked at and we all know much, but we don't know everything. We don't know the nuances, Father. We don't know the little bits and pieces. Help us to chew on the Scriptures, to think about them, to meditate on them, to compare our lives to them and make the changes that show us that we love you and we want to obey you more this year than ever before. Father, we thank you for loving us we thank you for being with us consistently and persistently and encouraging us each and every day. We thank you for your love for us, Father. Help us to look up to you and to Jesus and say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, for another year in which you've given us to be loving to you and loving to those around us. Father, we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.